Hello and welcome to the Print Soft Cover, where we unveil books and speak to the authors. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you this book by Pamela Gail Malhotra. She is no stranger to the world of uh, wildlife conservation, environment, etc. Um, this book is called From the Heart of Nature. One look at this book should tell you what is in store for you. But let me tell you, when I did open the first few pages, Pamela, of this book, I thought I was only going to read about your, may I call it, brilliant journey into setting up India's first private wildlife sanctuary. But this book offered so much more. Thank you so much for joining us here on The Print. It is such a pleasure to speak with you. First of all, I would like to know the thought behind this book. You know, it, it, it has taken you many, many, many years to realize what you call was your childhood dream. So tell us a little about the entire, the, the thought process behind putting all of that together in this book. Okay. Um, the childhood dream was something that my husband and I pursued for decades, actually. He was the one that turned the dream into a reality for me. Uh, I have always been a barefoot girl in the woods, always loved animals, and my husband shared that love with me. Um, I think part of that comes from my uh, mother's side, uh, being part Native American Indian. Uh, so she was always, always uh, helping me to see nature in a beautiful, exciting, joyful and respectful point of view. So the journey that my husband and I took, took us around the world uh, from where we met in my home state of New Jersey in USA to Colorado, where I was going to college. And we spent a lot of time in the mountains there. And then on to Hawaii, where we actually had the opportunity to establish our first small small wildlife sanctuary there on the big island of Hawaii. Then we came back to India, principally because Anil's father was very ill. And when we ended up taking his asti up to the Himalayas, we fell in love with the Himalayas and the beauty of, of those sacred mountains. So we thought we would establish the sanctuary there, but it didn't work out that way. It ended up being there were land sealing laws there that limited what we wanted to be able to do. So then it fell to my husband to find some place in the South in order to be able to do what we wanted to do. Uh, and that was because of uh, the, the land sealing laws not applying to plantation lands. So it was my husband who really, his, his diligence, his dedication, his knowledge from a legal and a financial point of view, it was he who really put the sanctuary together uh, and first found the lands and then put it all together. So um, it was a joint journey all the way. Uh, perhaps my dream was the inspiration, but he had the tough part <laughs> of turning the dream into the practical on earth reality. <laughs> And then writing the book has always been something that I had hoped would happen because we've had a very interesting life together, going literally around the globe together. And beyond that, my hope was that I would be able to inspire others to love nature as I have loved nature, as we have loved nature, nature and to take up the cause of protecting Mother Nature, especially at these times when there's so much going on around the world from a climate change point of view and lack of fresh water, all of those things. So the book, I hope, will sow a lot of seeds in the hearts and minds of the readers and will hopefully inspire others to replicate what we have done, no matter where they're living no matter what part of India they're living in or across the world. Like you mentioned, this, this here in uh, 
Karnataka's Kodugu is not the only wildlife sanctuary that you've, of course, this is the biggest and probably the best realization of your childhood dream, but you've, you've had, you've set up your first uh, wildlife sanctuary, uh, you know, in Hawaii, then you, then there was in uh, Uttarkashi and now in Kodugu, but this book, when I uh, read through its pages, I realized that this was not just a documentation of your journey of uh, setting up this wildlife sanctuary at all. Within the pages of this book is this lovely, uh, a love story, if I may say, uh, if I may say, uh, between you and Anil, or between human beings and nature. This wonderful uh, uh, relationship between nature and spirituality, etc. Through the pages, also you speak about the symbiotic relationship in nature and how essential it is to human beings. Is it, do you believe or do you think uh, that we have lost the sense of this? symbiotic relationship or so to put it in simple sense just a love story between human beings and nature yes i do i think we are the more impoverished as a result of losing our contact with nature because nature is our mother and we as a species evolved in nature uh, our senses our intellect all of that evolved in nature as a response to the various uh, environmental situations we found ourselves in as human beings in nature. And one of the things that the ancestors and the ancients recognized that was very clearly, without nature, we can't survive. And without nature being in a healthy state, we can't survive either. And they recognized that there is something very sacred about Mother Nature. If you go into the Veda culture, so much of the Vedas talks about being in connection with nature, being at peace with nature. This also is um, uh, like an echo from my own Native American culture. They always recognized every aspect of nature as a brother and a sister, part of the collective nature family that we all had a responsibility to respect and we all had a responsibility to protect and live in harmony and balance so that the family could prosper and continue for generation upon generation upon generation. So this is something that I think we have really lost touch with when it comes to the way we are living now. Most of us are living in concrete jungles instead of green jungles anymore. And it is important and necessary for people to be able to find ways and means to earn a living, et cetera. But even when Anil and I were working, in Denver, which is a very big city and is an even bigger city today, even when we were there, we always took the opportunity to get out into nature on the weekends without fail, to reconnect our hearts and our souls to nature and to enjoy the incredible wonder of nature and, and wildlife. All of the intimate experiences we had with different species of nature helped us to get rid of the tensions and problems of the unnatural world we were working in and uplift us in every way, putting our mind at peace, uplifting our soul and renewing our own love between each other. It's, it's very hard not to feel love when you're in nature. In fact, uh, part of the book talks about scientifically, how nature helps us just by being in her, how it actually changes our brain waves so that we're calmer and we're able to remember things more and solve problems more when we have to come back into our work situations or whatever our living situations may be. So all of these things are now being documented and the scientists are beginning to sound more like the ancient wisdom uh, men and women of different cultures telling us, yes, 
We need to get back to nature in a very, very, very big way for every aspect of our life. This book is filled with anecdotes, even uh, what you just spoke about, you know, just being in nature uh, you know, makes your life better overall. There is an instance that you mentioned in the book uh, once when you returned from Uttarkashi uh, to Hawaii, where your masseuse was also surprised about how 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 uh, it had changed, how you had changed, how physically you were much stronger. Overall. But the book also has a lot of anecdotes over uh, centuries of persecution, whether it is of um, you know Native Americans per se. You've spoken about politics. You've spoken about uh, wartime, whether it is the Vietnam War uh, that impacted uh, uh, you know you so personally and your uh, relation. Uh, you know it, it kind of. Um, gave you a perspective on how what to uh, decide on politics etc which which probably reshaped your political ideas in the us or whether it is the bangladesh liberation war here uh, in india you speak at length about nuclear weapons the the impact that human greed as you put it in the book or the need for human beings to assert themselves and the price that we have come to pay uh, over the years how crucial was to was it to bring all of these components together in this book that largely is uh, that largely is about preserving nature and you know allowing people to learn a lesson from your life as well or take inspiration from your life as well on prioritizing nature over everything else i think it's very important for people to understand that almost virtually all conflicts have their roots in arguments and and fighting over the control of natural elements you see that again and again and again through the history of mankind and especially especially in the last few centuries and as we destroy nature we create more of these conflicts between different peoples around the world because the natural resources have been depleted to the point where everyone is instead of cooperating to help build nature back again and protect what we have left we are instead fighting one another uh, one another over scarce resources and this has been one of the saddest aspects of our disconnect from nature because it has left to a disconnect from ourselves for example as you must have seen even the studies that have shown the children that are brought up even with trees around them or are able to run on grass and dirt tend to be gentler then those who end up having to play in playgrounds that have asphalt and concrete it's just that connection with nature and when it comes to our weapons it, i think one of the things about our weapons is an example of how creative we can be and how destructive we can be now if we were to channel that brilliant creativity into more productive things from the point of view of saving nature working together helping to live within nature's balance harmonizing with one another we would be able to actually live in peace on the earth but human greed has to be controlled i believe uh, mahatma gandhi said nature can brought, provide enough for everyone's need but not for anyone's greed that is really the bottom line here and it is something that we need to examine amongst ourselves especially from a, a parent's point of view we need to think about what we are leaving behind for our children what we are leaving behind for our children are we helping the earth to be a better place than when we entered it or are we leaving it in a condition where they are going to be in grave danger from lack of 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 resources and from the warfares that are going to come over a result 
of fighting over those scarce resources. So it's something we really have to think about and examine uh, as individuals in our communities and in our states and in our countries around the world. Absolutely. Like I said, a uh, lot of anecdotes I thoroughly enjoyed. It's, it was almost like I was picturing what you were explaining uh, in your book when you speak about different geographical regions, whether, whether you're speaking about, you know, your near-death de- near uh, experiences overall. But one thing that uh, actually caught my attention was when you spoke about your time in Alaska and you speak about how literally a snow cap had melted by the time you returned uh, to the same place. Putting this in context, what do you have to say or what is the thought that crosses your mind when you see world leaders denying global warming denying uh, you know uh, calamities that are perhaps waiting to happen yes the calamities are waiting to happen and they are already happening all around the earth uh it is frustrating um and very annoying. And again, it just makes me question how much these leaders love their own children and their own families. It doesn't make sense to me as a, a, as, as a person who loves all children, um, human children and animal children too. Um, it is very frustrating because we are pushing the, the solutions onto the younger generation. And in doing that, we are doing them a great disservice. Uh, One of the basic tenets of Native American Indians is called the seventh generation. And what it basically says is, when the elders of the tribe make decisions today, they have to keep in mind the impact those decisions will have on the seventh generation. Hence, we have to have the long view, not the short view. We have to think in the long term, not the short term. Uh, Another uh, conservation concept is we do not inherit the earth from our forefathers. We're borrowing it from our children. If we could live with that kind of a concept, and if the leaders could live with that kind of a reality and a realization, then they would make a lot bigger changes and a lot more uh, effort in trying to reforest the earth, save species, and mitigate climate change through principally through protecting the natural world, which is what has been uh, the biggest loser in all of this race to develop at any cost. You know, over the years, you have been the recipient of almost a dozen awards, including the uh, Nari Shakti Puraskar in 2017. But I must ask you, when, one, did you anticipate that you will actually end up setting up a wildlife sanctuary? And at what point did you, you know, even think that this would be a possibility or that you would want to do this uh, along with Anil, of course. When did, you, when did you think that this probably is what you want to do in life, to set up a private wildlife sanctuary? Uh, I have always loved nature. I've always been in the woods. I was fortunate to grow up uh, in my, my family home bordered uh, a an estate of a wealthy landowner who loved nature and loved children. So he did not mind us running around in the forest all the time. So the seeds were sown way, way, way back then. But it was after meeting Anil and having a spiritual awakening, if, it, if you will, that the goal to create a sanctuary filled with wildlife and in a pristine uh, situation, a pristine shape became a much firmer 
um, goal for our lives. And it became an overwhelming, uh, an overwhelming quest and desire to fulfill, especially as time went by and we saw more and more and more deforestation coming and more and more of the wildlife species going, uh, both in the US, but especially here in India. This is an incredible country with an incredible treasure trove of animals and plants found nowhere else and an incredible culture that has always, always been linked to nature in the past. It's just a question of reviving and remembering those links once again, so that we can save the earth for future generations. I like how the term that you use, that's when the seeds were sown. In fact, that is one of the names of the chapter and I couldn't help but uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to notice that Throughout the book, you have used very, uh, uh, I think you've used terms like this to describe yourself or the life uh, or the move in your uh, life that came about, whether it was, like you said, so in the seeds, uh, there is a chapter named Taking Roots, and then there is a chapter that is uh, named The Final Transplantation. So, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but notice how uh, uh, deeply you were connected with the subject that you were exploring, which brings me to another question, like you pointed out. Uh, you were lucky, not just in terms of realizing your childhood dream as an adult, uh, as an adult, but as a child to also be in nature, be close to nature. You know, grow up in a uh, in an env environment where there were trees and there was a lot of uh, space, and you uh, very, you were in touch with nature very closely. But how do you inculcate love for nature in people who have lived? as you pointed out rightly, in concrete jungles all their lives. Because the love, uh, love for nature perhaps came to you very naturally because of the way, uh, because of your heritage as a Native American as well. But how do you see uh, the way forward in instilling love for nature and ensuring that people who live in cities who perhaps go to the park for a walk and our interaction with nature is limited to that, where uh, being in touch with nature is in fact a luxury. Even if I did want to uh, be close to nature, maybe I do not have uh, the luxury of being in uh, the lap of nature. So how do you inculcate love for nature and prioritizing environment in a situation like that? I think education for the younger generation is principally important. And now you do see a lot of um, environmental studies being taught within schools at the various levels. So that is a good step forward. These education programs need to be enhanced, in my opinion, by having the children experience what it's like to grow something on their own. Just growing a plant in a schoolroom or having homework to have to grow the plant in their home and monitor it is a fascinating way for a child to be introduced to nature and the joys and wonders of watching something grow and then watching it put forth a flower and watching it put forth a seed. So I think the education uh, world has a huge responsibility here and an opportunity here to help introduce all students, no matter what their, their ages are, to nature in these manners. I also think it is the responsibility of NGOs to reach out to various students as well and schools as well, starting nature clubs, taking the children to parks, having them learn how to identify plants or butterflies or birds, even if you can't see the birds, identifying them by hearing, listening for them. These are things where NGOs can step up and help the uh, educational departments of, of schools in this area. I also think businesses can help a lot too. They can help with CSR funding, 
in these areas to help create these kinds of retreats into nature. There are places that children can go safely, and there are some NGOs where children can experience actually going into nature um, on a weekend retreat or something along that line. Even a day retreat, if it is a day retreat that's spent and you end up picnicking outside during that picnic time, learning to make sure that you pick up all the things you've left there so you don't take anything but photos and leave nothing but footprints behind you, those themselves can go straight into the heart, especially of the younger generation, but straight into the mind of older children who can be fascinated by all this. And I think in communities, people need to reach out to one another, reach out to one another and start these kinds of concepts to help enhance forest areas, natural parks within their own neighborhoods. People have to step up. We can't just expect the government to do everything for us. They can't, it's not possible. We have the responsibility to step forward and pitch in on our own in whatever area we can, in whatever way we can, whether it's in schools, whether it's in the business areas, whether it's in neighborhoods. These are the ways that people can come and help one another and help one of their communities and help Mother Nature as well. No, in the book also, you speak about how when you uh, set up your uh, home in Hawaii or in Uttarkashi or here in Kurgu as well, you've paid so much attention to make it self-sustainable. You've made, you've taken so much effort to uh, make it solar powered, um, eco-friendly, green houses, as you as you put it in the book as well. But where it, it, it isn't as if we are at a time uh, in um, in life where we can stop development or infrastructure, that is something that is absolutely necessary in today's world. And so is uh, conservation of our um, uh, wildlife or environment uh, overall. So where do you draw this line? Where do you say, you know, this is all human beings would need and the rest of it, can, uh, rest of the efforts and the resources should be allowed to thrive alongside uh, human beings? I don't think we should draw a line. I think we have to merge the worlds together. I think that that is one of the biggest opportunities that we can see in development from the point of view of developing green energies and helping them spread across the rooftops. For example, I am a very big fan of solar energy, not so much centralized, but decentralized solar energy, where solar energy can be put on the rooftops of buildings throughout city areas and throughout village areas as well to provide decentralized solar powered energy. In this way, you will create a tremendous number of jobs, tremendous number of manufacturing facilities, installation, repairs, uh, uh, checking things. It, it can really help create jobs in all fronts. And also, you can look into architectural planning. There are eco architects now that are looking to merge both the concepts of forests and greenery within the buildings that they produce. There are ways of building buildings where you take your cue from Mother Nature. For example, some architects are looking at termite mounds that are built that keep a temperature so nice and cool, even in the high point of summer and adapting their concepts that the termites use in building these termite mounds with our actual large buildings. This coupled with natural sunlight and, and solar panels, uh, all of these can help even from the point of view of using when we take our wastewater, if we can use it and create things in the recycling of the water that can be beautiful in the forms of waterfalls running through the buildings, 
and it all becomes a closed system rather than open where you're throwing everything away. So I think that these kinds of concepts, you can already see them being used in parts of the world. For example, in South Korea, they have done some extraordinary work with architecture. And what they've also done is they have encircled at least 38 of their city areas with city parks in order to allow people in the city access to these natural forest areas so that people can get away easily and be able to experience nature in this manner. And these parks help people with their health problems, and they also help to soak up all the carbon dioxide and clean the airs around the cities as well. So these are some of the ideas that we can use so that we can build a bridge between humanity and nature, quite literally, quite literally building that bridge. And uh, learning from the Northeast states, you know, it takes them centuries and lifetimes to build those bridges out of roots. We have to have that kind of a long-term view. We have to think along that line so that our children and our children's children will be able to walk over those bridges and know how to make and repair them in the future. So I think that the lines can be blurred. I think that we can meld the two together. I do believe that there are areas that should be left strictly to wildlife. I think it, it is very important to do that because we ne they need to be able to exist without fear. In fact, the forest department personnel, several of them who have seen camera trap videos that we have of elephants, for example, here, often remark about how calm the elephants are here, how calm they appear. And it's true. And it's because they don't have to worry about running into humans here or being harassed or anything like that. So I do believe that we need core forest areas that are devoid of human encroachment and human interference in any way. But years ago, there was an idea of a five-tier area in order to have the core and then build some buffer and buffer and buffer out to the human habitation. I think that concept needs to be revisited again. I really do. Even in the book, you speak about how animals or wildlife, otherwise all aquatic beings are other children of mother nature. So before I let you go, I must ask you, how is it to live in Noah's Ark as your wildlife sanctuary has been so rightly, like to say, um, you know, uh, spoken of? Uh, it is a privilege and an honor and a joy every single day. I am so, so privileged to be able to live this kind of a life and to have realized my dream of being in the heart of Mother Nature on a daily basis. I hope through the book I can share some of those experiences to help other people feel that love within their own hearts for Mother Nature, and to go out and do the quest, join together, whether it's families, whether it's business, whether it's friends, whatever. We need more private forest sanctuaries to help the government piece everything back together. So join in and help Mother Nature. And in the process of helping Mother Nature, bringing back the forests and the wildlife, we'll be helping ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela, for joining us. It was such a pleasure not just to read the book, but also to speak to you about it. And I hope, like you said, your book inspires more and more people to be more green conscious because God knows we need more green warriors today. Thank you once again for joining The Print. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm.